My name is John Schult. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Communication. And one of my interests is public opinion on climate change in the US and the factors that shape it. So my colleagues and I have done a number of survey experiments um, using national probability samples. Uh, and we've learned some things. And in the talk today, I'm going to highlight four of those things, give or take, um, that seem to matter for apparent public opinion on climate change. The first thing is that the language um, surrounding the debate seems to matter quite a bit. And so we became interested in this when we noticed that some surveys that purport to measure attitudes about climate change were in fact fielding questions, survey questions, that were worded in terms of global warming. Global warming, of course, is a related uh, but distinct phenomenon that likely carries very different cognitive associations that could shape respondents' survey um, answers in, in the survey context. And what we've done is we fielded two national survey experiments, the first in 2009, a follow-up replication attempt three years later in 2012, where we randomly assign respondents to one of two versions of a standard um, survey question that reads, you may have heard the world's temperature may have been uh, going up or changing over the past 100 years, a phenomenon sometimes called global warming or climate change. So we're directing their attention to global warming or climate change terminology. And they report their personal existence belief on a one to seven scale from definitely has not been happening to definitely has been happening. And this is typical of what we find. Wording matters, but we can't seem to push around the beliefs of Democrats. They believe that it's happening. Where we see the action is Republicans, the group that is typically more skeptical of the phenomenon's existence. Republicans are less likely to report high existence beliefs when the survey question is worded in terms of global warming. We think this has important implications because it speaks directly to the apparent partisan divide on this issue that we hear so much about. We're actually seeing about a 40% reduction in the apparent partisan divide under climate change wording. So wording seems to matter. But what about the warming that the survey question alludes to? And specifically, is it talking about warming that's occurred in the, in, occurred in the past or warming that occurs in the future. Climate messages differ on this dimension, and indeed, uh, climate survey questions do as well. And this is a question that my former graduate student, Sung Jong Ro, became interested in. And in particular, he built this interest on some work in social psychology, suggesting that prospection involves more freedom in mental simulation than does retrospection. And he hypothesized that if you're a person who's more skeptical that the phenomenon exists, then a message that conveys that global warming will occur in the future might give rise to resistance. Because after all, the future is inherently uncertain. And so to test whether or not this mattered, we embedded a survey experiment um, into the Cornell National Social Survey. We worded the question, the similar question that you saw previously. We tweaked the wording so that it read the world's temperature has been going up over the past 100 years, which is pretty standard language. In the other condition, it was worded the world's temperature will go up over the next 100 years, which is something we hear from the IPCC and, and other authoritative organizations. Does it matter um, for the opinions that we capture in the survey? Indeed, it seems to. Under the past wording condition, we see a partisan divide that's of similar magnitude to what we've captured in the past. Um, but under the future wording condition, this divide is increased, um, increased significantly, consistent with Sung Jong's hypothesis. OK, so wording seems to matter. Temporal direction seems to matter. Well, what if we now look at the timing of future impacts? So in other words, let's hold temporal direction constant and ask the question, how do people respond to global warming's impacts that are said to occur in the near term or the longer term? This is a question that some undergraduates of mine uh, became interested in this year. I'm very fortunate to teach a class on survey research with Peter Enns in government. Class is called Taking America's Pulse. And every year, students write and actually field an, an original national opinion poll. And this year, we had a group of students who were interested in this idea of climate departure dates. For those of you who are unfamiliar, departure dates kind of a relatively new concept. And it's meant to capture the time point in the future that various places on Earth will enter a climate that is qualitatively different than anything that's come 
before. And these dates range from as early as 2020 in tropical areas like Indonesia to late dates like 2070 in high latitude places like Alaska. And so these, um, these students embedded a wording experiment onto the Taking America's Pulse poll. And the wording of the question was this. Scientists have predicted global warming will cause irreversible climate changes by 2030 in one condition or 2100 in the other condition. Both are factually true. And we wanted to capture, does that affect people's stated policy preferences? The question in particular was, given this, how important do you think it is for policymakers to prioritize reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Response options were very important, uh, somewhat important, not important. So you can probably guess that it matters, or I wouldn't be talking about it. Um, we get the partisan divide on Republicans and Democrats who say it's very important that the government prioritizes reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Somewhat surprisingly, I will say, that gap is increased in the 2030 condition. I think that's surprising because I have this intuition, I'm sure many of you do too, that a sooner date ought to uh, feel more motivating, right? And, and feel more pressing and should inspire um, action. However, we're not, we're not really seeing that. And I think there's a number of mechanisms at play here and that we're, we're following up on. But I think one possibility is you might be capturing people here thinking, well, 2030 is too soon for any policy that we enact to have a meaningful effect um, on, on the state of uh, climate change. OK, and finally, much of the work that's looking at climate change public opinion from a social affiliation perspective has focused on political affiliations, just like those three points that I just shared with you. But we think that perhaps we're neglecting other important social identities and affiliations that might matter, and in particular, the role of race and ethnicity. There's some recent work um, suggesting that whites and non-whites in the United States might engage with climate and sustainability sustainability issues in, in somewhat different ways. For example, there's research suggesting that compared to whites, non-whites express uh, frequently greater concerns about climate change and more awareness of asymmetric climate impacts across social groups. And we thought, well, maybe the factors that often lead to polarized views on climate change are just sort of less influential for non-whites as compared to whites. It's a hypothesis we had based on that work. And we took a look uh, by reanalyzing some data from our 2012 uh, survey experiment with GFK Knowledge Panel. And what we see in particular is that we look at the association between political conservatism and personal existence beliefs in climate change. What we see is that the association is stronger for whites than it is for non-whites. So if you look at non-whites, that's the dashed line, it's flatter than it is for whites. And also, if we take another look at the wording experiment that I began this talk with, global warming versus climate change, we break out respondents by white, non-white. What we're seeing is that effect is showing up only for the whites. It's not showing up um, for non-whites in our sample. And I should say that these effects persist when we control for the usual suspects, like um, income and education and the like. So I'd like to. Um, end by just thanking my terrific collaborators on this work who are pictured um, and listed here. Thank you very much.